Our scripture this morning comes from Galatians, Paul's letter to the Galatians. It is Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. The Word of God for us, the people of God, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you in all ways, for you are our rock and our ever-present Redeemer. Amen. Scripture starts right out about the concept of mocking God. What a concept. It seems like the last thing that anyone would want to do would be to mock God. I mean, but do we do it unintentionally? I mean, the things we do are intentional, but we're not intending to mock God. But do we mock God in the process anyway? There was a recent tweet from a pastor, a famous pastor, on a question he received whether it was appropriate to drink coffee in church. This, just let me pause. This is not a referendum on drinking coffee in church, but that's the question he got. And his back and forth on the tweets got 2.8 million views. So addressing the issue, he says, look, I want to cut to the chase, get to the heart of the matter on this, which is not about drinking coffee during the Sunday service. He said this, the heart of the matter is not coffee in the sanctuary. That's only a potential symptom, and there are lots of other symptoms that I'm concerned about. The heart of the matter is the absence of an existential, ongoing, terrifying, shocking, awe-inspiring, trembling, mouth-shutting, comforting, safe, satisfying encounter with the majesty and mercy of the great I am who I am. He explained, whose son said before Abraham was... I am, and he was killed for it. Now, there's a bunch of us here, including me, who drink coffee in church, and it's like, this is not about drinking coffee in church. It's about doing things that disturb your walk with God and continuing to do those things disregarding the fact that your walk with God is being disturbed. That, my friends, is mocking God. It's telling God, I know better than you. One of my favorite examples of the disturbing of the walk with God came from evangelist Beth Moore. When she was asked by someone, he said, could I play golf every Saturday? And she says, as long as it doesn't disturb your walk with God. Now, this question was asked against a backdrop where the individual was going to spend, I don't know, five or six hours on each Saturday playing golf. And that would keep him away from his family. He had to make a decision because if doing that caused or exacerbated a family discord, that would constitute a disturbance with his walk with God. Now, for me, if you've ever watched me play golf, you would know that it not only disturbs my walk with God, but it disturbs everyone else's walk around me. So I pretty much don't play. But what else are we doing to separate ourselves from God but are not on the task of addressing and trying to fix that problem? At this point, I was going to talk to you about King Saul of Israel, how Scripture said he was the most handsome man in Israel and how everything was going his way, but then he squandered his resources and his opportunities with God. And near his end in Samuel, he says, I have been a fool and very, very wrong. But instead, I thought I would talk about the Dallas Cowboys. How about them Cowboys? No, seriously, what happened last week? It's so interesting to me. I watch way too many sports shows. And after a week of commentary on television, apparently nobody knows what happened. That's why the owner shouldered some of the blame. And then he, would, he decided he wouldn't part with any of the coaches or the, or the head coach or the quarterback or any particular players. But it's clear that something fundamental went wrong because quarterback and coaching, tackling, you name it, every bit of it was off. In the week since the game, nobody can make sense of it. Although, if somebody said, you know, the night before the game, the team all ate in the hotel with the coaches and they all got food poisoning, we would immediately understand what happened, which would be focusing on the problem and not the symptoms. When things go wrong for us spiritually and we're in a bad place spiritually, we tend to focus on the symptoms, not the root cause of what we have been planting 
spiritually. Scripture says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Well, speaking of your root causes, therein lies the root cause of the careless and indulgent lives that we sometimes lead, where God has not been provided his proper place in the equation. These folks either do not believe the truth of God or somehow think that they will be exceptions to God's laws. So it's time for us to self-examine. The minute you do not feel comfortable inviting God into whatever it is you are doing, you have pushed God out and disturbed your walk with him. In essence, you are mocking God by saying, my way is better than your way, Yahweh. Thank you. <laughs> to mock God is to turn up your nose about the idea that God disapproving what you are doing it would impermissibly interfere with what you are doing with the hope that you can outwit God by just excluding him as if. The scripture says we reap what we sow. The thing is, like any other crop, we reap later than when we sow. So some of us are deceived because, for, for lack of a better term, we seem to be getting away with it. Now, scripture tells us today at the end of it all, you won't get away with it. But that's okay because we can disregard that scripture like we disregard other scriptures and other commandments. God, you said it or inspired it, but some of that jazz just doesn't work for me in my particular life. As if God didn't know you before you were born or God doesn't know you now. I can hear God saying, are you mocking me? One preacher described it this way. He said, watch a trash movie. It will affect your thinking. Dwell on evil thoughts. It will change your behavior. Feel sorry for yourself, and it will warp your friendships. Treat church as an option. Remain as a spectator. Don't engage with serving your God-given gifts. Don't give. Don't pray. Don't fellowship. And you will reap the consequences of weakness. Check out that last word in that quote. The result of making your Christian faith a practice of second or third or last resort results in weakness. And therein perhaps lies our misunderstanding of today's scripture. We spend a lot of time every day working through a theorem on how we're going to obtain results in our day. David, do we have another slide? There it is. A plus B plus C equals results. Interestingly, this, whoever authored this slide says luck is one of these things, but he doesn't believe in luck as I don't. He just says that's context. So A plus B plus C equals results. We get good at it for certain things like a recipe for a food, for a dish, or, or how we plot our day to get up and have our routine and we go to our job or school or whatever it is we do and we come home every day. We recognize the end result in doing that because after a few tries, we seem to get the same result, and that's what we expect. But when your A plus B plus C is treating church as an option, remaining as a spectator, not engaging in serving with your gifts, don't give, don't pray, don't fellowship, initially we thought we might incur the wrath of God. But when God didn't smite us because of those practices, you know, lightning did not come down on us, we figured the result was some sort of acquiescence by God. The problem is, is that the result we are obtaining is not what we were looking for. We expected God's rebuke, perhaps in the form of fire and brimstone or some great personal tragedy, but what we, while looking for that and breathing a sigh of relief that it didn't happen, we got weakness. Weakness in spirit, Weakness in resolve, weakness in faith, weakness to resist temptation, and just general weakness because we're not allowing God to work within us. Put another way, we are not allowing the seeds of God to be planted in us. And as Scripture tells us, we reap what we sow. Indeed, that means you reap exactly what you sow. In other words, when we treat church as an option, remain as a spectator, don't engage with our God-given gifts, don't give, don't pray, don't fellowship. We're not flexing some sort of muscle of firm resolve, but instead we are merely operating out of our own weakness, planting that weakness rather than our strength. Think about it. When we blow off church, do we proclaim, 
I am an independent man or woman, and I will make my own decisions. No, we typically say things like, I don't feel like going, or the people there are annoying, not you. Or I'm afraid if I give money to the church, I won't have enough to live on, even though Scripture tells us 10 different ways from Sunday that God would never let that be the case. Never strength, always weakness. In short, God's got this. We don't. And when we think we do, Scripture tells us that we are deceived. In this instance, fooling ourselves. Fooling ourselves into believing that we can tell God to step aside. And when we do that in that process, we literally mock God, taunting God, saying, your supposed promises are not promises. Oh, oh except that promise of eternal life. We like that one. God, can we just have that one? Suppose God said, well, so many of my promises to you were revealed through Jesus. I, I sent Jesus to you for that purpose. Jesus even started the Christian church for you, this very church. Remember his conversation with the apostle Peter. Eternal life has to do with believing in Jesus, all that Jesus stood for, and not just that he existed. Well, so God, what's the answer? Uh, can we just hang on till the end and do our own thing and then get that promised eternal life? Suppose God said, no. Let us pray. God, you've revealed yourself to us through Jesus Christ. It's all apparent, the truth, the love, the grace. We can't just take a part of Jesus Christ, a part of his life, a part of his blessing, a part of his instruction. Lord, it needs to be all, and it needs to be the thing that when we were missing that or, or failing, that we're always striving to get toward that instead of pushing you away, saying, we've got this. And your laws don't apply to us, Lord. Help us to flip the script on that, bring you into our lives, and plant the seeds of Jesus in us so that that's what we sow when we reap. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.